Hi everybody, this is James Tompkins and welcome to an Understanding Finance Nugget where I do another challenging time value money problem. Now the one I did before this, I said, hey, you know what, if you can do that, as far as I'm concerned, you have an in-depth understanding, not memorization of this stuff. And, and while this one is not quite as challenging, it's a totally different animal that's also very challenging. And, and you, you put the two of those two together and congratulations, that's all I can say, at least as far as this topic goes. So what do you need to be able to do this one? Well, you can either watch, obviously, my single cash flow and multiple cash flow, those two lectures, or if you want to condense stuff, you can look at these uh, nuggets. Uh, two rates commonly used in time value money equations. That's the nominal state or advertised rate and the effective rate. Uh, driving the only single cash flow formula that exists. You know, forget all these textbooks that make, you know, they seem to want you to memorize a bunch of different formulas, which are just rearrangements of the only single cash flow formula that exists. And then driving the present value of an annuity. So here's the problem. You inherit an annuity from a rich uncle of $12,500 every two and a half years, beginning 17 weeks from today for a total of eight payments. And we've got a, a rate assumption, and, and the question is, well, hey, you know, what's the equivalent dollar amount today? And there's the answer right there, about $54,000. And go ahead. I, I would encourage you to try this on your own. So, you know, maybe struggle with it and or maybe do it all completely. That'd be great. And then and then maybe watch this if it's uh, if it'd be helpful to you. So here's what the problem boils down to. You know, 12,500 every two and a half years. When does it begin? 17 weeks from today. How often do you get these? Every two and a half years, a total of eight of them. Assume a rate of 8% compound quarterly. Now, before I do any finance whatsoever, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take a stand on the interpretation of the problem. You know, look, I've been working with this stuff for, for a really long time. <laughs> Afraid to tell you how long. And I still have to do, take a stand on the interpretation of the problem before I get into the calculations. And so how do you take a stand on the interpretation of the problem? Well, I want to visualize it. So I'm going to draw a cash flow timeline diagram. So first question is, well, what do the periods have to be? Well, how often do we get these, these cash amounts, these 12,500? Every two and a half years, right? So how often do the periods have to be? Two and a half year periods. So if I draw this, then basically I'm calling zero today. Zero prime is 17 weeks from today. That's when I get my 12, first 12,500. And then I'm, if you will, restarting the, the period clock where these periods are two and a half years. And I have a total of eight of these 12,500. Since I begin with a zero, well, I've got one through seven, and then plus this one is eight. So these are two and a half year periods. So what kind of an effective rate am I going to need? Well, I'm going to need an effective two and a half year rate, right? And I'll probably also need an effective weekly rate to bring this back to time zero. So let's begin with these rates. So the question says 8% compounded quarterly, and we'll begin with, say, the two and a half year rate. What is the equivalent effective two and a half year rate? Well, again, what is the only, by definition, the only first step I can take with that 8%. So this, you know, and with definitions you memorize. Okay, I've memorized the sky is called the sky. I, I, I don't know why the sky is called the sky, but it is, and I've memorized it. So with definitions you memorize, you don't understand. So by memorization, what's the only first step I can do with that 8%? Well, divide it by 4, right? Why? Because this 8%, is that already an effective rate? Or is it a nominal, stated, or advertised rate. Well, by convention, unless something tells you, hey, this is an effective rate, you have to assume it's a nominal, or stated, or advertised rate. And so this is an annual number, by convention. There's four quarters in a year. 
So the only thing I can do with this 8% is divide it by 4, and now, by definition, I have an effective quarterly rate. Well, what's an effective quarterly rate? Well, it's the amount of interest made from $1 after one quarter. So in other words, a dollar is going to grow into a dollar two after one quarter. But we want to know what the effective two and a half year rate is. So what's that? Well, the amount of interest made from one dollar but after two and a half years. So if with the quarterly rate, you know, to, could I figure out how much a dollar grows into after ten quarters or, or two and a half years? I could, right? Is that a single cash flow problem? Yeah. Yeah. I'm taking a single cash flow and I'm moving it forward ten quarters, right? So using the only single cash flow formula that exists. Okay, this is the one that if you went through that nugget, I, I illustrated how you really already understood this, not memorized, but understood this. So in this problem, what would I put in for my future value, which is the later value? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out, right? What would I put in for present value? Well, we're beginning with a dollar. What would I put in for my R, my effective rate? Well, I'm going to move this dollar forward quarters, so I better be working with an effective what? Quarterly rate. And what about my T? Well, how many periods am I moving this dollar forward? Ten, right? Ten quarterly periods. So basically, if we put that all together, basically the dollar would grow into about a dollar twenty-two after ten quarters. So what's the effective two and a half year rate? Well, how much of that dollar twenty-two is interest? Well, about 0.22, or to be more exact, 0.219, right? So therefore, our effective two and a half year rate, the amount of interest made from one dollar after two and a half years is 21.9%. Well, we also need an effective weekly rate, right? So again, what's the only first step I can do with that 8%? Well, divide it by four, and so we've already seen that a dollar grows into a dollar two, so the effective quarterly rate is what? Two percent. Now, by definition, what's the effective one-week rate? Well, the amount of interest made from one dollar after one week, right? So what we do know is that a dollar grows into a dollar true after one quarter, right? Well, how many weeks in a quarter? 13, right? Why? Right? There's 52 weeks in a year, so 26 weeks in six months, so 13 weeks in one quarter. So, question, does there exist an effective weekly rate such that if we had weekly compounding, one dollar would grow into a dollar two? It does, right? And that would be the equivalent, if you will, effective weekly rate. Well, is that a single cash flow problem? Yeah. So, using the only single cash flow formula exists, what would I put in for my future value? Well, that's the later value, right? That's the dollar two. And what about my present value? Well, that's the dollar, right? And what about my R? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out, right? The effective weekly rate. And what about my T? Well, how many periods am I moving this dollar forward? Well, 13 weekly periods, right? So what would go right here for my T? 13, right? So if we you know, put the numbers as we said and solve for the effective weekly rate, we'd get about 0.152% or 0.00152. How do I do the algebra with this? You know, not that this is an algebra class or anything, but I take both sides to the power of 1 13th. So on this side, that would be 13 over 13, and that would go away, and this would be 1.02 raised to the power of 1 13th. And then I'd subtract one and I'd get this guy right here. So 
now I can redraw this, and, and now I, I've got my effective weekly rate, which will come in handy, my effective two and a half year rate. So question, is this an annuity? All the 12,500s, is that annuity? It is, right? So can I use my annuity formula? Sure. And if you go to the, you know, how we derive the annuity formula nugget, you know, there's the formula right there. So how many payments of my 12,500 do I have? I have eight, right? So in, in this equation here, where would I put the eight? Well, in an annuity formula, T represents the number of cash flows, right? So basically, my T would be eight. Now, what kind of effective rate had I better use? Well, how long are these periods between the 12,500s? Two and a half years, right? So I better be working with an effective two and a half year rate. And what about my C? What will, what will I put in for my C? Well, those are the cash flows, right? That's the 12,500. So if we put that all together, using an effective two and a half year rate right there, there's my cash flows, I've got eight of them, I get $45,372. So question, for what time period is this true? Well, when you apply an annuity formula, is the solution at the same time period as the first 12,500 or one period earlier? It's one period earlier, right? So this is at time 17 weeks. So what's one period earlier than 17 weeks? Is it 16 weeks? No. Why is it not 16 weeks? Well, how long are these periods in the annuity? Well, they're two and a half years, right? So therefore, this solution is in fact two and a half years earlier than the zero prime. So go backwards in that direction two and a half years, and that's the time period. So how do we calculate that? Well, we're going to have to figure out how many weeks there are in two and a half years. If, if you do that calculation, well, there's 52 weeks in a year. So in two years, what's that, 104? In two and a half years, add another 26. So, so basically, there's 130 weeks in two and a half years, right? So if today is time period 17 in terms of weeks, and we go back in this direction in time, 130, we 130 weeks, basically this 45,000 roughly is true 113 weeks ago. If we visualize what that looks like, well, here's today, here's 113 weeks ago, and that's what this 45,372 is true for. But we want to know, what is this worth today, right? So what is this worth at time zero? Now, is it a single cash flow problem to move this forward 113 weeks? Sure. I mean, if I told you, hey, 100 bucks, 10%, what does it grow into in one period? Say 110, right? How'd you get that? You took the 100 and you multiplied it by 1 plus 0.1, except in this case, we're taking the 45,372, we're bringing it forward 113 periods. These are, these are weekly periods, right? So we're basically getting the, the future value of this 45372. So what numbers would go where? What, what would I put in for FV? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out, right? That's the later value in the context of this problem. What about PV, present value? Well, that's the earlier value, right? So that would be the 45372. What kind of R am I going to use? What kind of an effective rate? Well, are these weekly periods, right? They are, right? So I better be working with what kind of rate? An effective weekly rate. And what about my T? Well, how many periods, how many weekly periods am I bringing this 45372 forward? 113 weekly periods, right? So what would I put right here for my T? 113. So if we put in those numbers, we'd basically get about $54,000 more or less. And so that's your answer. You know, all of this is equivalent to about 
$54,000 at time zero. Now, here's a trick, if you will. I don't know if you want to call it a trick or whatever, but an alternate approach that sometimes makes it a little bit easier to figure out the time periods. But imagine this $12,500 at time zero prime was not there. Okay, so pretend that's not there just, just for a second, okay? Now, if that guy is not there, then how many of these 12,500s are there with the one beginning at time 1? Well, there's 7, right? And so if this guy at time 0 prime was not there, so we were just working with these 12,500s from time period 1 to 7, and so we applied the, you know, the annuity formula where for my t I would put in a what? I'd put in a 7, right? then if the first 12,500 was at time 1, because we're ignoring this guy, then the solution would be at what time period? Well, time 0 prime, right? One period earlier than this, this first time period right here. So if I put in a 7 here for t representing all of these guys and crush it into one single number at one single time period, which is then true for 0 prime, can I add, now add this 12,500, which is at zero prime? I can, right? Because they're both in the same time period. It's like, like this. If I have a dollar in this time period right now and another dollar in this time period right now, can I add them? I can, right? So I can add cash that is in the same time period. So if we looked at that trick in a sense, okay, here we have the annuity formula. I'm pretending I do not have this 12,500 just temporarily at time zero prime. So we're working just with these guys, in which case, how many of these guys do I have? Seven, right? So that's why I put a seven in there. So all of this crushes all of these numbers into one single number at zero prime. Okay? M maybe that comes to, say, 40. $3,000 or whatever. Okay, then I add my 12,500 because it's in the same time period. And I get the 55,308. So for what time period is the 55,308? Well, it's zero prime, right? And to get it at time zero, what do I need to do? Well, is that a single cash flow problem? It is, right? So using the only single cash flow formula that exists, then what numbers would go the where? What would I put in for future value? That's the later value, right? Well, that's the 55,308, right? What about my present value? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. What about my R? Well, I'm bringing this back 17 weekly periods, so I better be working with an effective what kind of rate? An effective weekly rate. And what about my T? Well, how many periods am I bringing this back? 17, right? So what's my T? 17, right? So if we put in those numbers right there, and you solve for present value, guess what? You get the same answer. And of course you would. So, so again, if you, if you did the prequel to this or the, the previous challenging time value money problem and now you've done this and, and you understand it, then again, congratulations because for what it's worth, at least in my opinion, you have a, a solid, in-depth understanding of this topic in finance. Anyway, I hope this was useful for you and I hope I see you in future lectures or nuggets or whatever. This is James Tompkins, and take care. Bye-bye.